name is Sai. I'm a product manager with Google Cloud. And uh, with that, let's, let's get into it. Um, so I think hopefully most of the folks in the room are security or security adjacent, have some experience with the problems of protecting users. You know, our users are under attack from phishing, malware, and fraud at all times. And it's really unique compared to protecting our own employees because we have less control over the environments in which our users exist. But they're just as important to our business. You know, with phishing, you know, 91% of all target attacks start with phishing. That's one huge vector in not only to your own systems, but to your customers and your users. And 8% of revenue for many online businesses is lost to fraud every year. Um, the problem is just the defense of these systems, especially when you go all the way out to the uh, user's computers, requires a lot of data and the ability to protect at the client level in an environment that you don't control. Now, just for some background, you know, here at Google, we've been protecting our own systems with two spectacular platforms for, for the last decade and maybe even more in some cases. The first is Safe Browsing, which defends over three billion devices from phishing and malware. Um, and then the other is Recapture, which defends more than two million websites from fraudulent use and bots. And we really took these two platforms and leveraged them to create offerings that you all can now use in order to protect your own platforms, users, and devices. The first of these products is Recaptcha Enterprise. Now, Recaptcha Enterprise is essentially an extension of Recaptcha V3 into the enterprise space that will allow for more nuanced and granular control and smarter and more refined decision making around what to do with fraud that you observe on your site. Um, the second two are based off of safe browsing. The first one there will be phishing protection, which essentially leverages the power of safe browsing to discover phishing sites that are targeting your company to add those, help you get those added to Safe Browsing, as well as enable you to potentially submit your own URLs that you observe to be attacking your users to Safe Browsing. And then the third product we'll introduce is WebRisk. And WebRisk is a URL, again, built on the power of Safe Browsing that enables you to check URLs in your own infrastructure, on your own site, in the content that you serve for unsafe URLs. And with that, we'll do a little bit of a deep dive into each one of these here. We'll start out here with Recaptcha Enterprise and really wanted to kind of frame the problem of kind of how we see a lot of people think of Recaptcha as just defending against bots, which it does, but it also defends against all different manner of attacks. And this could be, you know, scraping, fraudulent transactions, account takeovers, synthetic accounts, false post money laundering, and many, many more. I'm never, uh, never cease to be amazed by the creativity and innovation of our adversaries. Um, so there are just this myriad of threats that try and abuse your sites. And really the goal with the Recaptcha and Recaptcha Enterprise specifically is to make it as hard as possible for these adversaries to access anything on your site, be it a login page or even your home page, and make it as easy as possible and in fact as frictionless as possible for your own users to engage with and conduct legitimate business on your site. Now how are we able to do that? You know, Recaptcha really has an unprecedented level of visibility uh, of abuse across the web from the two million sites that we work with. And we're able to kind of combine all these collective uh, collaborative defenses to create a unique view on what is what legitimate and what illegitimate transactions look like across this large population, which enables us to train machine learning models that are able to recognize attacks in their many and evolving forms. And uh, speaking of evolving, I wanted to walk you through a quick history of Recaptcha just to bring up to speed because I think people's understanding of this platform vary because it's just been around for so long and has been experienced by so many different people in different ways. You know, it really got started with the kind of the squiggly bit of text that you're trying to read and, and type in. And, you know, as bots got better, you know, our defenses had to evolve. And that's why you see kind of these click boxes and crosswalks where the challenges have become a little bit more complex. And I know many people in the audience, probably myself, in, oh, myself included, can't touch the mic, <laughs> um, have trouble solving. And the reason they've gotten so complicated is not only just because of the AI threat, but also because of the farmer threat. So there are large groups of even warehouses full of people who are solving these challenges. So the threat is, in fact, a human threat as well as a bot threat. And we really have to distinguish legitimate from fraudulent transactions, not just bots from humans anymore. Um, not to mention that AI gets smarter every day, and maybe those will converge with the human threat. Um, and so really, that brought us to this, which you know is, is nothing. Um, just kidding. So really, what it is is a piece of JavaScript that can live almost anywhere on your site, anywhere on the web, interact with a user, and give you essentially a risk or a confidence score in whether this interaction is fraudulent or not without interrupting your user and without being easily uh, tested or defeated by a um, piece of AI or a bot written by an adversary. 
Um, and really, this is our effort to go into the behavioral analytics space and really try and use not just the challenge, but in fact, everything you can observe about the user from their interaction on the client in order to make a determination. Again, that's not only better for users and that it causes zero user friction. In fact, most users aren't even aware that they are passing this test. Um, but it also is much harder to defeat because the adversaries don't have a strong idea of what they have to program against or a way to train their own uh, attacks. And now with the Recapture Enterprise, you know, what we found is that with the introduction of V3, you can put the snippet anywhere, which means that you have a much broader set of use cases around where you can use this. I think in V2, a lot of the common use cases we saw was around the login flow. When there's already going to be a user interaction and already an interrupt there, we can add a little bit of extra friction to keep it secure. Now with a frictionless experience, you can put it anywhere on your site, kind of just like Google Analytics uh, would. And because of that, there's many more use cases that we want to enable enterprises, you all, to attune your business to and attune your fraud and risk teams to. And so we added you know, higher granularity risk scores. So rather than four scores, you get 10 reason codes. We'll tell you why we thought something on your site was high risk or something on your site might be worth looking at. And then an annotation API, which is the means by which you can help us tune our model and tune our protection to your particular site and your particular use case so we can get higher accuracy and higher granularity on our defenses for your own site and your own business. Um, so just with the higher granularity use score, kind of one example and one way to think about it is if you have very low granularity, you can do defenses of very different use cases. For example, defending a login page versus defending a home page. If you defend a home page, maybe you allow some questionable transactions through, or maybe you don't care at all if you don't care if bots scrape your site. Many you know, retailers we work with, that's the case, whereas very few people want anyone scraping or having automated uses of their login page. That's generally a bad thing. Now, that would be good if you have this kind of the four buckets, and that was that what that was designed for. With higher granularity, with these 10 buckets, you can draw even finer controls. For example, the way you treat threats against a password reset form versus a login form. Maybe those two are different vectors and different levels of security. And you can start making these really fine-tuned controls and tuning that you know, true positive, false positive, false negative rate for every specific part of your business. So you can ensure that you maximize the friction, again, for those attackers, and you minimize it for your users or legitimate folks trying to use your site. Along that same lines, we have our reason codes. And here are just kind of a few. And again, kind of going back to maybe the scraping example with automation, um, if we identify something as an automation attack, maybe it doesn't matter if it's on your homepage. Maybe you don't care if folks are scraping you know, the basic information you'd like the whole world to know. But rarely would you want to see that on a login page or potentially like a sending message page or various other avenues for abuse within your site. Um, and then the other two patterns are just ways for you to potentially identify um, different behaviors that you wouldn't want to see on your site. So for example, the unexpected environment indicates that their capture snippet has been extracted, and that's a common way that these recapture farmers will extract the recapture snippet into a different environment and have it solved externally. Typically not a good thing, not uh, being used as, in, used as intended, as well as the unexpected usage patterns, which could be any wide variety of things where you say, hey, this doesn't match the typical legitimate behavior we see for users, on your site, on this page. So again, we make it really, really hard where the adversaries to defeat this are starting to have to map to not only typical users, not only to your site, but specifically to the behavior that would be expected on your site, on your page, which makes it a much, much tougher defense and also much uh, easier on your users. Um, and then the last piece here is the annotation or the annotate API call. So when you use reCAPTCHA, it'll send you back a score and a label. So again, kind of that score, those 10 scores, as well as the labels that we showed before, as well as, and, and then when you receive those, you can annotate them and send them back to further help train this model. Something we heard continuously is that, you know, we really would like to share ground truth with Google and really help use the ground truth that you see in your business to help us create a model that's particular and tailored to your business and to your company. And this will enable us to do that. And here's kind of just how it works. It looks quite simple, but basically you just take the assessment that you're giving back from Google. Um, as you're thinking about implementing this, be sure to save that number. It's like your kind of receipt. And then you use that to send us back a note that says, well, this was a legitimate or fraudulent transaction. And you can do both. And you can do whether we're right or whether we're wrong. All will help us train and label our data sets to get better attuned to your specific site. So rather than, again, being served by this general model of the entire web, we can start using all of our protections and knowledge to tailor a model specific to your site. And uh, just a little bit for folks who may already be V3 users. I actually can't see, but how many people in the audience are V3 users already? 
Uh, it's pretty good to see four or five hands go up. By the way, this is the, the product team in the front row, all the heads snapped around <laughs> of intense interest. So the folks who are on V3 or any version of reCAPTCHA, really what, uh, the only change you have to make is, let's see, this thing doesn't have a laser pointer, does it? Anyways, at the top of the screen here, you can see you know, the end user client and the reCAPTCHA endpoint will kind of have a little conversation. A token will be generated and sent back to the reCAPTCHA customer server. From the reCAPTCHA customer server, which is kind of where typically your server code will live, typically you'd send that to the reCAPTCHA uh, assessment call to be decoded. Instead, you'll send it to a GCP reCAPTCHA enterprise endpoint. It's, it's basically like one line of code change. And essentially, it'll work in more or less the same way, except you just get more data back. So just a note, if you're transitioning from V3 to reCAPTCHA, it's about a one line of code change. It should be very, very straightforward. And we designed it to work in a very similar way to V3, so to make that transition seamless. Um, and also, here's kind of what the assessment will look like when you get it back. Again, you can see you know, the confidence highlighted there is going to be 0.1. So that's kind of the score we discussed. And it runs from 0 to 1 in uh, decimal increments. And then you also get uh, reasons if they exist. It could be blank. But if not, we'll give you the reasons, for example, automation that uh, you might expect. And so I know it's early in the morning. So, and I know it's dark in the theater. So if anyone's dozed off, now is the time to wake up. Um, we'll, do, we'll do a little live demo, which is always the most exciting thing to do as a presenter, uh, especially of a security product, by the way. So let's all do this together. Uh, do me a favor, go to g.co slash recaptcha slash demo. And I'll leave that up for a couple more seconds. And uh, if we can, can we switch over to, the, uh, to my laptop? There we go. And hopefully, you all will see a screen that looks a little, little bit like this. Now, this is just kind of a test demo page of what a user experience could look like with a CAPTCHA and what the admin experience looks like. Let me say, please do not put in a real password or username here. This is just a test. Um, so we don't want any actual data. And I'll, you, know, you put in whatever you want and log in. And you'll see the, uh, let's see, let me ignore this. You'll see a little thank you screen. I know Chrome wants to save your password. <laughs> Word of the wise, use password managers. They're great, <laughs> except in demos. Um, so if you see here, you know, kind of standard frictionless user experience, you wouldn't even know you're using your CAPTCHA. And by the way, if you're curious on your devices, you can go to this page and sign up right now. So we had a little sign up link. Um, but as an admin here, you can actually see that, oh, actually a lot of people are doing this. That's great. So thanks for the early engagement. Looks like about uh, 18 or so people tried to access this page and everyone got through. A lot of legitimate traffic. No bots in the audience as far as I can tell, which is good. Um, However, I try and run it with a bot. And uh, again, the team here helped me out to write a uh, headless browser that will go and attack the uh, page, much like you know, many of the bots that attack your pages in the wild will. And then it will return a screenshot of what it sees. And we'll see that it has a, you know, hopefully if it runs here. We're always on the Wi-Fi, which is like a, uh, <laughs> it's never a sure thing. Um, but it'll basically run. And then hopefully when the output is finished, it will show a screenshot of what it sees. There we go. And you can see here it's seeing a 2FA challenge rather than the thank you page that you all saw. And as you can imagine in your own sites and your own businesses that you'd want essentially those users to have that frictionless experience that you all saw and have bots like this that are running these repeated automated attacks seeing a 2FA screen so they can't really test passwords against your page. And as we go back to the analytics, you can see as an admin these attacks happening. You can see that they're marked as illegitimate transactions and you can see that the Reason code is automation. So you can start to track these attacks um, as they happen. And then again, start to tune and plan your defenses around that. Um, so and let's switch, switch back to the slides. That's the end of the demo. So thank you all for participating. I appreciate it. Early in the morning, it's good to see that enthusiasm for great security products. And uh, so that's about it. You know, Really, our goal with Recapture Enterprise is to stop fraud, not users. You can learn more at cloud.google.com slash Recapture Enterprise. I will note, for those of you I can see typing this in already, uh, this will all go live at 9 AM tomorrow morning. So all this stuff is technically pre-launched. You're getting the sneak peek. Uh, what was it about 22 hours before <laughs> everyone else does? So uh, take a note, and then it'll be live in, uh, in about a day. The next product I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into was phishing protection. And you know, just to outline this, you know, the way I like to think about phishing, and something our team has worked for more than a decade on, is it doesn't matter what kind of big, huge, scary castle you build. If you leave the gate open, everyone's going to come in. And that really is the case with phishing. We build some pretty amazing defenses. We see everyone across the industry build amazing defenses. I think everyone in the room probably knows that phishing is still your number one problem. It's people leaving the door locked. Um, 
really the goal with phishing protection is to stop people from clicking on phishing, period. Right? We know that with enough tries, and essentially the tries are free, people will always be fooled into clicking at some level. So we, we really want to ensure that as few people see those links as possible, and especially for those links that are targeting your brands. So for example, something that might use, say, the Google logo or the Gmail logo or things that are used in our iconography for pages to denote their login pages, often are used to fool users, especially using, say, mobile devices. And um, phishing protection leverages the power of safe browsing to not only classify those pages, but also to add them to the safe browsing list when they match our policy in order to ensure that users will see a big red warning that looks you know, a little bit like this color before they ever go to a phishing and malware page. So they're very aware, and typically they, they don't go there. I think our click-through rate is well below 3%. It's so one of the few places in our business where we focus on having the lowest click-through rate possible. Um, just to walk through a little bit of how this works, you, know, you as a business can submit URLs to phishing protection. So oftentimes there's existing detections from referral links, from your own email and security tools, or just from your own scraping of the web. Um, usually there's some really smart IT person, someone who's written a cool bot to find things that look like your brand on the web. You can submit those to Safe Browsing for crawling, so we can confirm that they are truly indeed malicious. We have a team of about 60 engineers who spent the better part of a decade building machine learning to recognize these things and recognize them as they evolve. So we have incredibly good detections around those. We also ingest data from a variety of third-party sources, or even first party sources from within Google. Once those are, all, those are all added to Safe Browsing, we'll notify you as a customer so you can institute your own countermeasures, be it takedowns, blocks, notifications, user education, whatever it is you've found to work well for your customers and your business. You'll get that protection on 3 billion plus devices. I'll note, this is far beyond the reach of Chrome or any Google products. Um, the vast majority of browsers, security companies, you know, web filtering companies use this list in order to protect their users. So you'll get a wide variety of protections almost wherever your users are. And then finally, this will be integrated into the GCP reporting analytics through Cloud Security Command Center. Um, quick note, just at a technical level, this is what submitting a URL looks like. It's very simple. Uh, you you know, use your project number and API key to submit a URI, and you know, then we take it in, and you'll see it come out the other end in um, Cloud Security Command Center. And if we can switch over to my laptop, we'll show the quick demo of what that looks like from the Cloud Security Command Center uh, vantage point. Um, <clears throat> here's kind of the dashboard you'll see as an admin of Cloud Security Command Center, which is kind of your one single pane of glass to see all the different security activities within your business. You know, it's a great way here at, at GCP we're trying to consolidate all the many dashboards. I know we all love to flip through doing our, <laughs> our daily business. Um, you can see here the finding sum summary. You see there's about 177 findings, and when you click on that, you'll see a full list of the different uh, findings that are available. And as you click in, you can see kind of the full details we'll offer. So you can see kind of the data was discovered. You can see you know, at the bottom there, if on source properties, was it flagged by safe browsing? Did it, was it reported by the organization? Essentially, was it reported to us? Um, and what was the URL? And oftentimes, folks will look for that combination of flagged by safe browsing and reported by you, because obviously, the ones you care most about are the ones you found, you want remediated, and you want to know what we did about it. So, uh, we'll provide that, and we'll also um, be providing kind of support from the product team. If you have escalations or questions around why something was classified, we can offer that back. I know for some folks, uh, safe browsing and our phishing products have been a little bit of a black box, so we're hoping to uh, enjoy a little tighter partnership with our enterprise customers um, through this product. All right, and that was it, so we'll switch back to the uh, slides. Last time, I promise, thank you to the, to the guys in the booth. Um, and here, you can uh, just learn more here at uh, cloud.google.com slash phishing protection, and it's a way to help you find and prevent phishing before users click. And the last product we'll talk about today is WebRisk. And WebRisk is essentially you know, a way to protect you from malicious URLs. You know, we all know that URLs can contain dangerous stuff, you know, phishing, malware, all sorts of bad stuff, and safe browsing examines more than a billion URLs every day in order to create a list of a million, your, a million or more URLs. And really, it's access to that list that we're providing now. You know, and here's an example of maybe how it can work in practice. So let's say there's a, you know, there's a website, Acme Tech Reviews, for you know, tech events in San Francisco like you know, Google Cloud Next. And it gets more popular. But as it gets more popular, you see a bunch of this malware come up. And this is actually a very common trend of behavior we see. As sites, as businesses hit this inflection point, where they attract users and start becoming really popular, we see the fraud come right along with it. So it rides right on the coattails of your success, which is often quite frustrating. And then it kind of dampens it. 
So as that site gets more popular, attracts more malicious content that's showing up on the site, it starts to drive users away, which is bad for that business and bad for that business's growth. And so really with the WebRisk API, what this business, you know, Acme Tech Reviews could do is send good and bad URLs, kind of all URLs posted to its site, to the WebRisk API to check to see if they're known to be malicious or known to be unsafe or not. The WebRisk API will send the data on known unsafe or known bad URLs back to the Acme Tech Review site. And then Acme Tech Reviews can only post the URLs that were not found to be bad to the actual public site. And that way it kind of makes sure its content is a lot safer and more secure. And then its users aren't being targeted by the propagation of malicious content. And uh, here's really quickly what the uh, queries will look like. There's two, two basic methods. One is you can essentially submit a URL, and that's the one on your left. Um, and uh, submit a URL, get a verge back, pretty simple. The other one essentially consists of a local database of partial hashes you can run queries against. And when there's a query match, we'll send back, and you can see that on the right, you can see a list of different uh, URLs that may match. This is not only faster, but it's also privacy preserving because Google never actually sees the URL you're looking for. We only see a set of possi possible URLs you might be looking for, you might be interested in. Um, as you know here, expire time will kind of denote the time for which we would like, we, our terms encourage you to consider the URLs unsafe. And uh, the negative expire time is a time which we discourage you from making another call because it's unlikely the verdict will change, even if there is no verdict. So kind of consider it like, you know, don't ask again for a little bit. <laughs> um, and we go back to our example. So now let's say Acme Reviews has installed this and starting to filter their sites. What will happen is they'll start to make sure that their site is free of malicious content. And you know, the users return, and their growth can continue. So for any company that does kind of content filtering, has large amounts of user-generated content, you know, highly encourage them to take a look at this WebRisk API. Uh, we actually launched this back at RSA. So this is the one product that's up. You can go look at it now at cloud.google.com slash WebRisk. And again, you know, we have data on more than a million URLs from scanning billions a day. Um, and I wanted to kind of just close quickly here with a discussion of you know, how this fits together is a hijacking prevention use case. So fraud and just attacks in general, things that are self-propagating work together. You know, someone fishes a user, steals a password, tries it on a website through automated credential stuffing or even manual credential stuffing, and then it's that compromised site is used to repost more phishing and more malware, and that, you know, negative malicious cycle continues. We really designed this suite to work together to block every step of that cycle. So phishing protection is designed to stop users from clicking on phishing to ensure that they are, their passwords aren't stolen in the first place. We have a CAPTCHA enterprise, and among many other things, will stop credential stuffing and stop those passwords from being used, even if they are compromised, or at very least giving you some notice that people are using these in an attack. And then finally, we have WebRisk, which prevents the propagation of phishing and malware through these large user content sites and through any sort of security filtering systems, be it email or anything else to ensure that even if a site is compromised, it doesn't start spreading to the rest of our ecosystem.